This was not the snappiest title in the world that Ed gave me. Um, can we define convenience retail around the theme of community and environmental sustainability? So I thought we'd change it to um, short, now is our time. I think we'll begin there. And I feel like we've had a lot of uh, PowerPoint slides over the last couple of days, so, so mine are short and basically a little bit of humour on some of them, I hope. All right, well, thank you, Ed. Um, I'm really grateful, actually, for the opportunity to contribute to the conference today. I am truly, as someone pointed out to me this morning, not even out of the womb when it comes to the cooperative movement, as I only joined uh, last September. So when Ed asked me to do this, he asked me to do it uh, very much as a newcomer to the movement, bringing sort of um, some of my experience from, from outside to the table. And I've spent my career developing sustainable business programs and building sustainable brands for mainstream businesses, large and small. So the likes of Asda and Unilever are the sort of organisations that I've worked with in the past. So I feel a bit like a sort of poacher come gamekeeper standing here in a way. Um, in those organisations, I fought to get sustainability on the table during a time when there was absolutely no recognition at all. Uh, to business um, at uh, and what it's like doing business through a, through a sort of sustainability lens. It was either viewed as a cost or, from a corporate responsibility perspective, a box to tick. Um, I remember one particular occasion when I was working for Unilever and I was sitting opposite the head fish buyer for Sainsbury's. We were negotiating a deal and uh, they could be particularly cutthroat, the, 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 the two Sainsbury's and Tesco's. And he looked at me and he said, Amanda, just, just get me sustainability, will you? And uh, he said, I don't know what it is, um, but if the big T have got it, then we want it. And uh, that, sort of, that was pretty much my life for about a decade. So when I joined the cooperative movement last September, I did so in a way because I felt driven to. Um, at the time, I was writing a chapter on a book on sustainability and tipping points in society, which, which the Royal Society was sponsoring. And in that piece of work, I was calling for business to be much more proactive about stepping up to the challenges humankind faces with bold, mainstream, at-scale solutions. I was highlighting that to deliver on this in the long term will require new approaches, uh, new approaches to how we all do business and a really honest reassessment of the values that underpin why mainstream business does what it does and what its role in society was. And I was sort of writing in there about how new business models were needed and new approaches to sustainable economic activity were required. And I sort of sat there writing this and thought, well, actually, I'm basically writing about the cooperative movement. Um, so then Christmas 2011, uh, when an executive role came up at the East of England Cooperative, a, a vibrant, independent co-op, I jumped at the chance and was pleased to get the role. And I do believe the timing is right. The opportunity is here now for the movement once again to come into its own. Whether it be the economic tsunami of 2008 or the summer riots a couple of years ago or just the entrenchment of austerity into society and everyday life, there are tipping points all around us that are signalling the changing shape of the world we live in and consequently the changing needs of, uh, of our members and the communities we serve. Um, the question is, is can we realise our opportunity? Uh, we, we, it, it is out there. Um, we could pick up on the themes of community and sustainability and really transform our prospects if we do more than we're doing now. And, as Pauline was raising this morning, as we, as we, if we communicate it better. The building blocks of cooperation and our business model very much feel right for the 21st century, and I keep hearing that, and that's great, but we do need to change, we do need to transform and develop ourselves. Um, I was excited listening to Pauline's presentation this morning, I, I, think, I think that she, she got it bang on, and I share her desire to see the movement recognised and, and grow. And, but there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done on identity and, uh, and participation and sustainability because to win in this area we need to be consistent, we need to be authentic and we need to be transparent. They're absolutely key. So as part of the sort of transformation that we need to face, and just briefly for, for my slot, I wanted to consider um, three hows, if you will. And the three hows are how you can't beat them, join them, just doesn't work. How we need to go beyond shared value, and I'll explain briefly what that is, and how local really is our opportunity. So how you can't be to join them doesn't work. Well, what do I mean? 
What I mean is that I think what we have done is allow ourselves to be perceived as the same as everybody else. We recently conducted in-depth, far-reaching research in the East of England, which sought to understand what people think of us, not just the East of England cooperative, because as we've said, there's confusion, people not really sure who's who or what's what, so it's, so it's really about cooperative retail. And the overwhelming message back um, was that the cooperative movement, who we are, what we do and why we do it, isn't well understood and it's even quite misunderstood. So we're kind of perceived to be the same as other retailers. And it is problematic to join them if we have problems competing at the basics. I think we'd all agree, we've all seen the different graphs, price goes up the top. It's part of your sort of getting you in the game as it were. Um, and then we saw Ben Reed's presentation yesterday and showed Tesco's buying power, um, 74 billion euro or thereabouts, it was next to ours, 8.8 .8 billion euro. So whilst Waitrose can pledge to match 7,000 of Tesco's prices or lines, we can only pledge to do a couple of hundred. And even if we do join a European buying group and we compete again on price, it is just part of getting us into the game. When we looked at Cecil's presentation from the IGD yesterday, she showed how we need to add value through products and service innovation, and we need to brand it strongly. All of which needs to be very relevant and immediate to people's lives. We don't have a survival strategy, let alone a growth strategy, without understanding that we need to innovate further, to, 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 to differentiate further than where we are now, and no matter how exciting or stand out our cooperative offer could be, we need to build powerful branding that communicates who we are, what we do, why we do it, and why we're different to our public. So for me, if you can't beat them, join them is a wasted opportunity. Um, we need to stand out from the crowd, not be chasing the leaders. And business has largely got CR and sustainability licked. Unfortunately, thanks to people like me. Um, much has changed since I began 17 years ago, and I was doing groundbreaking programs for Unilever at the time. Now it's becoming business as usual. Um, businesses are moving from corporate sustainability, so just initiatives, into more sort of sustainable business. They've worked out that it's not just about old CR, about a focus on their impact today, but it's about looking into the medium and longer term. They're sussed that it's not just about managing risk, but it's about risk and opportunity. It's not about cost, it's about value, not about communicating, it's engaging. They've got it, they've, they've, they've got it linked. Um, and that, it's not without virtue in a way. If you look at the results from Marks and Spencer's Plan A, they have been impressive. They had a net profit of over 70 million as a result of Plan A activities in 2012, compared to 50 million in, in, um, in uh, 2010. And, it, and there are all sorts of ways that they make up that 70 million. I was standing in McDonald's the other day, for the first time, I must say, in a decade with my kids on the half-term holiday, and I was struck by how they reinvented their offer. Um, through the years that I've done sustainable business work, I followed with interest, particularly the development of that, orga that organisation, because they are seen as such a big, ugly multinational. Um, but now they win awards, and like other businesses, it serves them well in providing assurance to the public and its investors. It's not all necessarily true, there might be a lot of people who argue with it, but they're very good at communicating it, and they're very good at playing the game. And I'm very well acquainted with the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, the work that I did for them a good 15 years ago in, 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 the, uh, in the early and mid-90s um, and late 80s, really has formed the basis of their Sustainable Living Plan now. And their goal now to double their business whilst halving their environmental and social impact through their value chain is actually aligned directly with their growth agenda. And they're actually leading the way. That multinational, with all of the things that go on in multinational supply chains, still they get to lead the way on this discussion. Which I find shocking in a way and part of the reason why I'm standing here. But they have seen market share and investor confidence increase, while that of their competitors, who perhaps aren't quite as good at telling the story, have contracted. And it's a far cry from when I worked with them, and at that time, Greenpeace were out sailing down the outside of Blackfriars building, while the chairman was inside saying, what should we do? And that was the beginning of the sustainability story. Regardless of size, medium or large, as I said, I, th I think CR business have got CR licked. And there are even def different definitions of it. This definition, shared value, was set out by two guys, Michael Porter and, and Mark Kramer, in Harvard Business Review in 2010. 
And it's been quite useful for building um, the business case for sustainability, taking the view that long-term sustainability relates to business creating economic value in a way that adds value to society by addressing its needs and challenges. Great. However, context is really critical in this discussion. And that, in some ways, is really, really adds our opportunity, you know, sort of brings our opportunity forward. Um, the focus, as, as austerity bites, um, even deeper into society and resources become scarcer, then the reality of the need to change fundamentally how business does business will really come forward. And what we get is basically businesses having to stop sort of thinking so much about business value and the concept of social value within this starts to come forward and that's where the opportunity is really for us today. At the moment, business provides the life support of nations, whether it be water, drink, roads, medicines. In the long term, success for business tomorrow will be to help customers change their lives and live differently. And as a cooperative movement, we're well positioned to go beyond shared value. Shared value is still about the profit motive, and we can go beyond that. We can use it and go beyond it. As austerity entrenches, resource constraints get worse, worse, PLC will be cornered in that way. First and foremost, we need to put our membership offer out there, our member value at the heart of our communications and our actions. We need to bring together our retail and our uniqueness. I'm completely for integrating those messages into our communications in every store, on every window, in every door drop. We actually need, in a campaigning voice, to be saying who we are and what we do. Um, and we mustn't be shy of that. Um, but that's just the basics. We need to be more sophisticated from that. And Ursula's example of the LM3 yesterday is a really good example of the cooperative movement having the opportunity to get more sophisticated building our own local and regional ecosystem so that we use our business model, our products and services to reach into people's lives and dovetail with the social and environmental needs of the day, as it were. Of the many questions that face businesses today to help build loyalty, there are two sort of key ones that come out. Does your product or service improve my life and what are you doing to act on the things that matter in my life? We need to be sure that we respond to this. We need to look at some of the concepts that are out there. It's interesting, Ursula was talking about pharmacies and libraries. I'm on the page of looking at what Jamie Oliver and, and um, Richard Branson are doing with money lounges and recipes. They're all about bringing people together and using the opportunity to socialise and learn. So we need to think about our offer and perhaps do it a little differently or take the opportunity to do it a bit differently. We can also add um, sort of value through our products and services. Marks and Spencer's have got their swapping concept, which is really about recycling clothes. Um, Sainsbury's have worked on getting the Green Deal in their stores. There are products and services that we can start to bring forward that help change people's lives. We also did an uh, initiative recently at the East Union College, which was called Reducing the Strength. This was really interesting. What we did was we worked with the Suffolk County Council and the Constabulary and also the local NHS. And basically what we were doing was we took um, strong cheap beers and ciders off the shelves because of the antisocial issues um, that exist in, in Ipswich. We actually did it to all of our stores in Suffolk. That's interesting, it was very brave. Um, what about obesity and diabetes epidemics? Food retailers are on the front line of the calls from academia and politicians to do something about that. Will we be part of leading the way on finding solutions between choice and changing behaviour? There is opportunity in all of this for us. Okay, just to sort of start to draw to a close, for me, local really is our opportunity. If we're seeking to develop strong, active and engaged membership, so I think of the participation that, that uh, Pauline was bringing up this morning, we need to understand how we market our movement of collective action. I do hear within the movement as well as without that we're not understood or we're misunderstood. We need to solve the problem of making um, a movement which is all about the value of we relevant in a world where it's all about me. Not me personally, you realise, but <laughs> the individual makes, 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 the, makes the decisions. And the answer is in local, and it's not just a sign over the door, it's not just Sainsbury's local or Morrison's local. Um, we did our region wide market research, we wanted to get under the skin of this and find out what really matters to people. Um, and the big things matter. 
They go through the planet tissues. These things matter, but resoundingly, what people care about is me and mine. It starts at home, the street I'm in, my neighborhood, my village town. The clear message was, do something that matters for me. Help me secure a future locally for me. Help me with uh, investing in my region. Um, help me locally, and you help make my life work. So to be relevant and immediate, to drive loyalty and engagement, we need to make our movement the local sort of regional ecosystem. And that really builds on the LM3 concept. We need to go further than that. So I won't go through our, our locally sourced, our source locally initiative that we started in 2007. You heard about that last year from my colleague Roger Grosvenor. But like Lincolnshire, that's very much a starting place for us. But we're looking at how we can go further. How can we position ourselves as the engine of the regional economy? How can we build our cooperative ecosystem to be central to local regional sustainability? Um, we can help people, uh, individuals, to live more sustainable lives with new products and services. We can work to build a truly local supply chain to benefit local businesses and communities. We can ensure our profits go back to local communities and we can connect individuals to it. But can we also add another cog to the, to the, to the whole engine? Um, we, could we develop a member benefit program that helps people locally work together to keep the pound local? Um, and to the drive locally beneficial behaviours, basically. Um, so what we're looking at at the moment is a new member benefit program that will do just that, a program which will link up regional partners um, to create incentives and benefits to members. Pubs, hotels, days out, use of the local swimming pool, getting a discount. In a region where 50% of the regional tourism uh, actually comes from within the region, we're in a really strong position to do something interesting with that. Also, the most sort of important bit for me in finishing is to be effective at hyperlocal, we need to get personal too. So we can tell them what the organisation does for the region, as in LM3, and that's great. But actually, what we need to do is work out how we can bring it to life for the individual. So what's the individual's impact in the region? We need a convincing way to show that we don't just do initiatives, that we are the local community. And a way of doing this is to show the relationship between the members and their community. So we need to move beyond talking the same language as other businesses, about corporate responsibility programs and local activities. And what we need to know is show that we're not just connected to communities, we actually are them. How could we do this? Well, if you think about just, just things like club cards do their, their quarterly report on, on, uh, on what your point status is. Couldn't we do a quarterly report or could we digitalise it, thinking about what Cecil was saying yesterday, um, to show how services have contributed, how our services and an individual's use of those services has actually contributed to the local economy. And we don't have exact data on this, but it is out there. That's what Facebook effectively does. Facebook builds its social graphing around that, around that whole concept. So what we're looking at now is how could we do that? How can we take this further? I, I believe that, yes, the time is now, and yes, we could redefine convenience and retail around social and environmental sustainability. I think there's a real opportunity there. I think we've got an opportunity to position ourselves as champions of sustainability, but only by going beyond the limits of where mainstream business is, because mainstream business is good at it. We need to challenge what they're not doing and show leadership in helping create new social norms and changing behaviours. And we can do this because we're cooperative. So we can take global sustainability and the local agenda and make them our own. Not just through our products and services, our supply chain, our procurement, but also through partnership. And most importantly, by personalising it and looking at new ways of how we can make it relevant, such as through social graphing, um, uh, and immediate to individuals. And if we do that right and get our core messages right, our positioning and our branding right, then we have much more opportunity of really embedding our movement into people's lives. Thank you.